Where's the humanity in all of this? Where are things that feel human and raw? What is good art? You know, I remember Mr. B saying, I have to cut out character development because of retention. What are you rebelling against? We got to optimize everything. These are the rules. Art can't even exist. There's not a place for it. Do you stress about money today? Very much a privilege. If you can make money off of your art and survive, like, holy cow. 10 years from now, what do you want your story to be? It's a hell of a question. Max Reisinger will save YouTube. At age 18, he co-founded the YouTube New Wave, a movement fighting the Mr. Beastification of content by telling powerful stories that are anti-clickbait, anti-algorithm, with friends like Natalie Lin, Wholesome Simon, and Ryan Ng. At age 20, Max helped raise more than $200,000 from brands like Polaroid and Notion to support the New Wave while documenting his life growing up as a creator through YouTube. He's an artistic entrepreneur who convinces brands to fund his fight for art against the algorithm. And today on the Carrot Podcast, he shares why YouTube is broken, how to do business with friends, and how to create meaningful art. When I look at your content and your work, there are so many moving pieces mm. that work together. I can't help but think it's deliberate. When I even go to your channel, you describe it as a real life documentary that's been going on for four years, going through every <laughs> part of your life that shows everything you do across three, four businesses, your content, your friends. But when this all started, when you made your first video, Austrian Roads, as a 16 <laughs> year old, yeah, was that planned or was that just by feeling an instinct? That was, a, a plan that had been on pause for many years because I was too afraid. There was a plan. Like, I always wanted to start YouTube, but it was just, I was a very shy kid. I was introverted. I was awkward. And I never had, like, the kick in my ass. So then what came together for that Austrian Rhodes video to overcome that anxiety and fear? Yeah, I was very uncomfortable. Um, I think I was unhappy with who I was, but more so I saw a version of myself of like, hey, if I get through the other side, I could be this part of myself that I really want to be. And it was really uncomfortable because every action and thing I felt was just so far away from that version I saw myself as or like what I could be. Um, but I would turn on the camera. I remember my first video. I was trying to film myself, but I was also trying to like hide from the camera. I was trying to film myself as like as least the you know amount as possible while still putting out a YouTube video and still being in it. Now, four years later from initially finally picking up that camera and deciding to be a better version of yourself, you've transformed from, gosh, like I'm afraid to even be in this camera to I think YouTube needs to change and sure. I'm going to develop the new wave. New waves often start as reactions to what was orthodox and classic before. Yeah. They're rebellions. And so I'm curious... What are you rebelling against? And what was the moment you decided <laughs> I need to change YouTube and develop <clears throat> the new wave? Sure, sure. All credit goes to Ryan. Um, Ryan Ng, uh, one of my closest friends, he was a film dropout. And so I met him, I don't know, like two years ago now. And so he kind of started the inklings of a lot of the, the new wave. Um, so I'd say a lot of that came from him. And I think more of his frustrations, but also our, you know, general observations of this space at the time where I felt like a lot of the rhetoric was optimization. Um, you know, I remember there were clips, I'm pretty sure, I mean, fact check me, but Mr. B saying I have to cut out character development because of retention. Um, <clears throat> and it just felt like hyper optimization, hyper sensationalism that was just taking over the platform. Um, and obviously YouTube's a massive space, but at the time it felt like that was just all we were seeing and hearing about in the creator world. It's just like, ah, it's kind of exhausting. It doesn't feel right. At the time, like TikTok houses were rising. Everyone was in LA and it's just like, where's the humanity in all of this? Or like, where are things that feel human and raw? Like, where are the stories um, that we can all relate to and touch to? And it felt like we come from like a Emma Chamberlain kind of era and maybe Casey era where things are a bit more personal and raw to like, YouTube can make money. We got to optimize everything. These are the rules. You got to play the rules. And if you don't, like, there's not really a space for you here. Um, mm. So there's a reaction to a lot of those things. Given that YouTube initially started, as you said, more along Casey and Emma, why do you think it shifted so totally over to this 
retention, the metric in some ways matters more than what it's even trying to capture. Money, probably. And then also just, I think that's the natural just path with you create any sort of game or any set of mm. rules or something. Someone's going to figure it out. Someone's going to push it to the limits. And I think there's certain figures. I think a lot of people point to Beast as like, you know, he figured the game out and figured out, you know, what could, you know, please the algorithm and max it out to get the most amount of views to be the biggest creator. Um, so I think it's always inevitable in some capacity, but uh, natural, I think capitalism, I don't know, like people want to make money I and mean, it's not like a bad thing. Like I, I think mm. in the beginning, not that I was like upset or anything. It was more so of just like, now it's more like this can exist, you know, just as media, there are still game shows. Like that's just part of it. And, you know, it doesn't have yeah. to compete with art. Like there can be space for both. But in the beginning, it's just like this is taking everything over. Art can't even exist. There's not a place for it. So now it's just how can we create a space for both instead of painting it as bad? Because it does. it's not necessarily bad. Right. It's different. When you put aside, though, metrics like how much money you make off of it. Sure. Or even necessarily how many views you get, which is very much driven by the algorithm, mm -hmm. optimizing for things like click-through and retention. How do you figure out what is good art? Mm. <laughs> a hell of a question like for you even yourself sure. when you put out a video do you think about oh part of it's how many people are watching is it more an internal sense of i felt good about what i made and what helps determine that i wish i had that fully i think there's still part of it that is you know something i have to be proud of and that i feel good about putting out in the world um but i still to a certain degree have to like care about the views that's still something i think about i don't avoid that entirely um but when i think about creating you know good art or stories it's more of how can i connect with people in an authentic and human way mm. um because i think that that translates you know through any medium whatever it yeah. is you know art or not art but like paintings music like if you can make someone feel something i think that's ultimately what it comes it's down like that to. same fairy dust you felt when yeah. you were watching casey's videos you're looking for hey, this is intermediated through what I've made in a camera that's going on screen, passed through fiber mm -hmm. optic cables on the internet to your screen. How can I reach through all of that and get that moment of connection? And I look at your content and it's about a lot of it, the changes in your life around moving, around mm -hmm. starting school, around yeah. leaving school, around yeah. the relationships that you meet and find. And I remember there's one video, I think it was the one where you talked about you, run, you were running four businesses and you're in a car and you're driving somewhere and like the gas runs out yeah. and you look at the camera and you're like, this is actually fine. <laughs> in a way, now I just get to see the limits of how far we could push this car <laughs> and like it's chill. And I kind of love that because as a metaphor, <laughs> you do so many things. Sure. And the story I have in my mind is that would be impossible if you didn't have this mentality of mm -hmm. like, let's just see how far we can take this to find these moments of connection. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really curious at what point did it evolve from, you know, I'm finally making videos and finally becoming more the person I wanted to be to, oh, like it's more than just me. I want to start a new wave. I want to start businesses around it. And were there moments along the way where you felt like, oh God, like I'm out of gas and what do I do? I never viewed myself as an artist or a creator in any capacity, still, like, I don't fully resonate with that when it's, you know, said or I'm labeled in that way. Um, I always viewed myself as, like, an entrepreneur just because, like, as a young age, or when I was younger, I started the lemonade stands, was doing the garage sales, you know, had an origami business. Like, my brain was always, like, ticking, and I was obsessed with, like, the numbers of sorts, which is kind of ironic. Um, so that was always within me, and then I just got mesmerized by the video stuff, like, completely by surprise. But I always still had like the ticking, you know, in my brain. It was just I didn't see how the dots would be connected. Um, but I'd say the tank out of gas was more so probably like a year in. I realized, okay, I could make money off of this. Like I got my AdSense yeah. checks. I could see the brain deals. But I could also see like going back to the car, like kind of analogy or metaphor, that there's a, a certain amount of gas in this car. Um, this creator stuff is cool, but there's like a, you know, a lifespan to it to a certain degree. You can add more gas, you know, into your, your car potentially. You could build, you know, a bigger tank, but also if I add businesses on top of it, then it's like, what is the tank? Is the tank, you know, money? Is it, you know, being a career or is it just like passion? Is it energy? And so shifting the tank from being like a monetary tank, like I have to just make money from this to how can I create other businesses to support this 
so that YouTube can just be pure about art and not about media and making money. So I always knew, but I kind of had this like, not crisis, but it felt like the Titanic. And I still feel this now. And even looking at other creators, like I have this like, like fear phobia of like, holy cow, like you're killing it right now. But like, I don't verbalize this to them, but I'm like, what are they going to do in five years? And it's not like a judgment thing, but like genuinely, like it, it freaks me out a little bit with some of the creator stuff. Um, just cause it's hard, you know, to run a yeah. business of being a creator, especially if you, if it's your life, um, it's a lot of extraction from oneself. So it always felt like a sinking ship. And I feel like only now am I starting to figure out the new ships that will like take me. There's a lot of metaphors, but <laughs> no, I love it. And I think there's this delicious tension between mm. you describing on the one hand, I create content on YouTube, not driven as much by money and by the algorithm. I'm looking for moments of connection enough mm -hmm. that together with my friend Ryan, I'm starting an entire movement called the new wave on YouTube. And to hear you say, but I don't even think of myself as a creator. I think of myself as an entrepreneur. The tie between the two, you said it's precisely because I'm building these businesses that five years from now, I'll be okay. And I can continue to let YouTube be more purely focused on connection. Mm -hmm. It's like you have this creative energy that Casey just came out of nowhere, struck you like a bolt of lightning. Yeah. And then you already were very business savvy. And he said, how can I make this work? How can I make art in a capitalistic world? Well, okay, I have to figure out the business side so that I still have the luxury of doing art. Yeah, this is not easy, you know, and I think it's a very much a privilege. If you can make money off of your art and survive, like, holy cow. But it's just like, that's rare and it's hard. Um, and I, it's not that I knew I couldn't do it, but like, that's just not the life that I wanted necessarily. People forget that yeah. Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel as a brand deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't want to. The Pope came to him. The Pope's one of his main patrons, one of his main sponsors, mm -hmm. and said, you're going to do this. And Michelangelo said, yeah, that's not really aligned with my artistic vision. I think of myself actually, uh, hmm, hmm, exactly, more as a sculptor mm. than a painter. <laughs> and the Pope said, okay, yeah, that's really cute. Do this or I'm not going to support you anymore. And mm. he said, okay. <laughs> and what's funny is in some ways, that's one of his most well-known pieces the constraints that came from the business pressures on his art actually helped him develop into something more. And it reinforces your point. Like it's really f hard. What I love is when I watch your video about how you run four businesses, including creator camp, where you physically developed a home base for people like you thinking through how to do YouTube to gather together where the artistic side is really cool. You're helping people be like, you don't need to be like Mr. Beast. And the business side, like you literally raised like 200K in sponsorship money. You're thinking about how to scale this into something lasting. Perspectopia. Yes. Your merchandise apparel line, right? Mm -hmm. Circle Park, a brand agency, and of course your own channel. And you were doing this all on top for a while of like also going to school. And I remember thinking to myself, this guy who's so focused on art does so much in business, how? And I remember you said for you, Business is also how you learn and develop and grow as a person. Yeah. And I think business isn't art. Like, I don't think they're that different and that they don't have to be that different. Um, like, there's so many parallels, but it all is just such a human thing. I think that's what I've learned. And also, like, I'm running all these, like, things. I'm a part of them, but there's so many other people. Like, even the new wave, like, originally the inkling started from, like, Natalie mm. and other folks. Um, so none of this is like an independent thing. Yeah. If I you do it there, together it. with others. Yeah, and like it's that's the only way I ever could is just there's so yeah. many people I couldn't even name all of them. You were saying how yes, you started by business. saying business is an art. Yeah, yeah, it's human. And it all is about like connection. Like it all like you can't escape it. And that's like I think the a common misconception about business as well. And even when I viewed it when I was younger, I was like business, it's like white men in suits doing handshakes and like tall towers. Um, mm. and I think it comes off that way and it's still like that still exists in the world but. as we say in a tall tower yeah, I know I know I know <laughs> um, I just think it doesn't have to be that all the time um, and even in running the businesses like I just can't 
run away from humans. Like it's all like relationships, connections, how people feel emotions. And that is just art. It's, it's like the same thing. Yeah. Um, it's just, you might have more structure in a different way, but like ultimately the more time I spend in both, the more I'm like, Oh, you guys are kind of just like the same thing, but it's like yin and yang in, in, mm. in a lot of ways as well. Well, you're describing business as art because it involves number one, people and relationships. Mm -hmm sounds like to me, a lot of the work you do, it's because you're bouncing off the people working with you. And number two, like there's this creative element. When we were walking okay. over here, you mentioned a hey, creator camp. Mm -hmm. Historically, this retreat for creatives that was funded by brands, which makes sense because a lot of things are funded by brands. And you're thinking through, how can I evolve that business model? Because, hey, these brands are great and you've worked with some incredible ones like Polaroid and Shopify. And, hey, is there a way to fund this differently? Like ways to like develop the business model more. And I could see the gears whirring in your head. You're almost like, how do I construct this to be different? Mm -hmm. Like I could yeah. see the artistry. Yeah, yeah. I think of your channel in a way. Have you ever heard of this German phrase, Bildungsroman? No. It refers to a coming of age story. Mm. Like mm. in a way, Harry Potter is a coming of age story. Sure. Your channel is a coming of age story, right? It's like you see how someone starts, you see how they grow and change over time. Yeah. But where did that impulse come from to even be on camera or make something on camera at all? That's a good question. Um, I mean, way back, I feel like most creators started out watching, you know, Casey. Yeah. Um, and that gave me like this feeling of like this world that I could be in. Um, and I remember it was just like this magical little, like, I don't know, like this golden energy, like fairy dust almost that I felt when watching it. And like, I was like, I love this, but how could I create this and replicate this for someone else? I think that's what I've always been chasing is how could I take the magic he made me feel and share with others? Cause that was such a powerful thing. Cause it kind of made me see like, oh, I could get out of this. Like I could become a, a different version of myself and it's not like some far off distant reality. Um, so probably comes down to him honestly it's so funny because in a way i'm hearing you describe your experience watching casey and i'm hearing it wasn't just oh i think the con he makes is really cool it's the type of person who lives the life that's being captured through the camera and now shares it with others like that's the type of person i want to be yeah what is the dream the dream ultimately i don't joke about this but because i like i actually mean it but um Ryan and I joke about it because we're like, we just want to be stay at home dads. You know, like I just want to have kids and have a family and be there for them when mm -hmm. I grow up because my dad uh, quit his job when I was raised. And so I'm like forever indebted to them and just that like love I felt. Um, but ideally, I'm able to pursue things like purely. And I think that's like maybe a, a core theme to a lot of my work is how can pe people come together in the most pure way? How can you create things that are pure and human and raw? And so I just don't want to be financially tied down. I think to be stressed about money, to have things be limited by money is just such an unfortunate mm. thing. Like to be stressed about like coins, you know, like it's a, an unfortunate reality for so many people, but ideally it doesn't have to limit um, what's being created. So I kind of just want to not have to ever stress about it because I just hate stressing about money. So mm. that's kind of the dream. And then the rest is just like, how can I build worlds for people um, and create art and just have connection, but like in a lot of different domains. Um, but again, it's like, how do I figure out these models that can exist so that humans can just like be humans? Mm. Um, and those, that's like the gears that I think maybe yeah. you're mentioning. Do you, with, like, do you stress about money today? And it's not as much, definitely not as much, but it's more of like not stressing about money now, but more stressing, not stressing, but like, it's just like building puzzles. Yeah. How can I construct puzzles so that things can maybe operate better? Because I think money can create friction where like a lot of the models, I think through, you know, what would Creator Camp look like if the last year we didn't spend, you know, 70% of our like effort on sales? You know, what could we have put that energy towards? Um, so it's not like a stress, but it's more right. so how can I be calculated with the ways I get money and what that money goes into? That makes sense. Um, so I'm in like the next phase of my business, maybe self, where the first was just where could we even get money? Like what brands would sponsor this? Yeah. Like money didn't exist. But now once you have a bit more, it's like, okay, now we have money. Cool. But like, it doesn't just sit there. Like we should do something with it and be strategic. And that's kind mm. of what I'm trying to figure out a lot of the time. <laughs> and what prompted the decision to do Perspectopia 
as well as your agency, Circle Park, was sure. it similarly a mix around the artistic or was it more mm. business minded? Uh, it was just like building a world again because um, Perspectopia stemmed out of a community that I created when I came back home to America mm -hmm. after living in France and felt super alone. I was like so excited about the world. I was like, there's so much possibility. Like life is great. Obviously it's hard, but like I just had this optimistic spirit and I felt like no one resonated with it. And so I created Perspectopia, which is perspective and optimism or utopia around these like optimistic principles. So it was just like an optimistic community on Discord. We had like a whole functioning government and yeah. everything. A um, government. Like, yeah, like 60 people in a government. Wow. We had like a 30 page like constitution, like f all these people, you know, working, operating as like a whole country basically. Wow. Um, and then like I just love clothing. I love garments, like the shirt, like it's a cool shirt. Like I just am fascinated by design and stuff. Um, and I'd always wanted it. I even tried to start a merch brand when I first started YouTube, sold two t-shirts and they're both my friends. <laughs> Um, but it wasn't about money. Obviously, like it's nice to make some revenue from it. Um, mm -hmm. but it was just like, how could I build this world in people's minds where they could wear something that makes them feel good? Um, so it was like kind of a prescription I wanted to give myself, maybe mm -hmm. for other people, because I know how like clothing had made me feel in the past. And so it's coming from a place of feeling, like the same way yeah. your creative career started from the magic fairy dust. Mm -hmm. Seeing Casey and who he represented and how far off it was from who you were at the time. Perspectopia sounds like, yeah, in a weird way, it's like you went to France, you had a lot of these changes and improvements, coming back with this sense of optimism and being like, how do I build yeah. on this and build a way for people to connect with each other? Well, now I'm really curious for Circle Park, your agency, and for Creator Camp, were there also moments of emotional pain that prompted you mm. to invest so heavily in those too? Yeah, yeah, funny. It's funny you say that. Yeah, I mean, Creator Camp stemmed from like us living in Montana together. We were lonely creators. We didn't have friends. And that changed everything for us, you know, living in Montana for a month. You were there as a group. What was it about the experience that you felt so lonely? So before then, it was still like the loneliness of even when I came back to from France and America, I just didn't feel like people saw the world in the same way that I did, which is totally fine. It was just I wanted... I just kind of got a glimpse of, you know, what is out there. It's like, there's more out here than just like, you know, this little town that we're in and worrying about the AB classes and the college stuff. I was like, there's life, there's experiences, there's different cultures. Um, and I just hadn't really met people who are excited about the world, you know, which sounds like, I don't know, like I don't want to come off the wrong way, but like, I just didn't feel like I were around people who gave me energy. I guess yeah. that's what it kind of boils down to. Um, and I still had great friends, but I was kind of searching for someone who would just really light me up. Um, and so spending that time with him in Montana is like, oh my gosh, you know, we both get excited about similar things, also different things, but I feel energy from these conversations. I feel like a bit of magic and I like really relate to you in a way I haven't with other people ever before. What did you experience in France that, what was your state of mind, how you viewed the world going mm. into France and how you began to view the world differently when you left? I wouldn't say I was like closed minded. Um, I always kind of even before France, like there were rumblings. Like I remember being in math class and I was like, man, like my teacher was like an honors class. He was like, the, the kids, you know, they can be like self-taught. Like I don't have to like teach them. It was like this weird philosophy. I remember sitting in class. I like started like a mini crypto hedge fund because I was like day trading crypto. and I got my friend's money and I was like, I don't need this math class. Like I'm going to like make internet money. And this is before mm -hmm. YouTube or anything. I was like, yeah. I... I don't need college. Like, this is it. Like, I don't care how poorly I do. Like, I did find the math class, but I'm like, I'm not going to invest time in this. So there were inklings. I already had, like, the rebellious spirit in me. But, like, no, nothing to, like, back it up for anything. Um, mm. So it started then. But then in France, um, YouTube kind of gave me a bit of a medium. And then I got broken up with. And then that's when it all, like, kind of shifted. Um because I really was like rock bottom. Like I struggled to make friends there in France. I was 15, so I was young. I was like, I literally have nothing. I'm like alone in this other country. I have my family, but I'm in this culture. And I was like, how do I just build myself back up? And so I started reading books, kind of in the self you know, improvement niche. I was like, I just want to learn things. I want to be a sponge. I started working out more. Um, and then I just started being more adventurous and taking more risks. Like I met up with strangers and when I adventures traveled and uh, through that kind of gained this like confidence in myself and that started to snowball. And I was like, mm. there's more out there. Like I could be this, I could do this. 
and then I kind of just went from there. I guess like I'm trying to trace it back, but yeah, I mean that's the narrative I've told myself, I suppose. <laughs> you mentioned the narrative that I've told myself because you're mm -hmm. right. Like when we think about who we are, it's all just a series of stories we've made about ourselves. Yeah. yeah. You're an interesting point because you've documented on what a regular weekly to monthly yeah. basis everything that you're going through. It reminds me, there's this Norwegian author named Knosgard, mm. and he wrote multiple volumes, literally just going through every single moment in his life. Wow. To the point when he released it, multiple family members and relatives threatened to sue him to stop it being published Whoa. because it was so intimate. His wife was deeply hurt by how she was portrayed wow. in the book, wow, wow, wow. ultimately stood by it because he didn't have malice. He was literally sharing every single detail mm. from his life. Mm, mm. You do a version of this too. And so you said you look back on your time in France, why you changed so much. Part of it was due to this breakup. And you said this framing, well, it's the narrative that I look at for myself. When you think through your own life, do you watch your own videos? I don't yet. <clears throat> But it gets really like meta and complicated because mm. I think part of why so much changed in France is because I also had control. Like it's the weird thing of I'm filming myself, I'm watching myself, but I'm also editing myself. And I think maybe part of it is I was editing myself into who I wanted to be, like literally. And then the world sees it and I was like, yep, that's me. So I was kind of able to like edit myself into who I wanted to be. And then I agreed with it because this is what the world was saying. Like, this is Max. There's my face. And I don't think it was like consciously done by any means, but like slowly I've been editing these stories and even like how I approach a lot of my videos now, it's, you know, I'm filming moments in my life. I'm finding meaning in them. I'm connecting the dots in the way that I see it and I'm constructing that narrative and sharing it. Like, I think it's true, you know, but like, yeah, where do my biases come into there? But then if that video is out in the world and then that's what I believe, like who's to disagree? Cause that's my life ultimately. But like, is it all, fully true like i don't i don't i don't know it's like I don't, i'm not aware of the blind spots that i have and so i've told these stories over the past couple of years like i think they're very accurate but also like i don't share everything this is another misconception i think of yeah i share very small bits of my life and most of it's like pretty hidden but the, some things that i do share feel super vulnerable and raw but it's a small glimpse mm. but it's very meta and kind of confusing and like i'll probably have to like go to therapy on this for, like when i'm older if like what did you do to yourself? <laughs> the editing of oneself is a weird relationship, especially because you have intentions and like ulterior motives and ways you want to be seen. Because you're going through your footage and you're constructing stories that for most people might just be stories that they tell themselves or maybe a few others. You're constructing stories that, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of people are going to be. Millions. Yeah. Maybe yeah. millions. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. tens of millions, hundred millions. Who knows? We don't know. And so you're editing that story for them to watch too. But as you edit it, you're also shaping your own story for yourself. Yeah. Of who you were and who you are. Yeah, it's a weird thing of like and oftentimes the editing feels very intimate because it feels like it's for myself. Like I don't really think about the audience a lot of the time, but there's just so many variables variables at play and like what is motivating each cut, you know, and what is motivating the story? Is it is it really for me? Is it just a purely document or are there other like little incentives, you know, and and there has to be a spectrum. Like there have to be some like, yeah, there has to be part of my brain that's considering maybe this could get more views. Not if that's not like in a like a bad way, but like yeah. that has to exist, you know, in my decision making process. But I don't know where the spectrum is. And like, I believe you know, what I'm doing is like, in well, good faith. Yes. yes, yes. But I don't know fully. Like you can never be 100% sure right. with these things. Because now the stories you tell yourself have been influenced by potentially you need to get views to support the business And then what side. am I going to film in the future? Like how is the future also, you know, um, dictated by what I'm filming? Because, you know, am I doing this because it would be content, you know, good content for something? Yeah. Am I making this decision because it fits into a narrative that I want to construct? Is this a narrative that's true to myself or a narrative I view Max as and the world believes Max? Right. And it's not even necessarily a bad thing. Often the way we improve is we start to say, you know what? Actually, the story I've been telling about who I am, it's yeah. wrong. And I'm this type of person. For myself, I used to say, Eric, you're not a founder. Mm. You're too risk averse. Mm. You're too scared. Mm. If you'd want to found something, you would have done it already. That was a very powerful story I held for so long. And then yeah. I met people and mentors mm. who have backgrounds like mine and had gone and done their own thing. And they're just like, what the actual f 
And suddenly I began to evolve that story into, yeah. oh no, like I can be a founder. Mm -hmm. And then my actions started to follow. So I hear yourself describing, like you edit the narrative and like you begin to change yourself to fit that narrative. Memory studies have shown it's a very malleable thing. Every time mm -hmm. you remember a memory, it's not this pristine record that you pull out, look at and put back. The very act of remembering changes the memory. That's why it's very easy in some ways to quote unquote implant false memories in yeah. people. Like yeah. if I went to you, Max, and I said, hey, do you remember that time you were in five and we were in a Walgreens and you got lost? You'd be like, no. And then I just ask you this question every month for a year. And one day you might be like, did this happen? Yeah. Like, I feel like it might have. And so you're editing your own recollections of YouTube videos. You are changing your own memories of what happened. Yeah, yeah. You are self editing in the most literal sense. You said that you think one day this is something you want to talk about with a therapist. What do you mean by that? Have you done therapy before? I have done therapy. It's such a bizarre relationship to have with yourself yeah. that feels like it can only really exist today. Like it feels kind of new. Like obviously there have been writers and stuff, you know, in the past who have told stories about their lives. Mm. Um, but this feels a little more different because of the way it's done in a more public way, I suppose. And then I'm editing it. Like, I don't know. It just feels like a really bizarre relationship that I don't really know the full to extent of how it will affect me. Like I feel fine right now, mm. but it's more so it feels more like uncharted, I, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and it would be something interesting to just like peel back the layers because I think there are blind spots. Yeah. You know, it's just good to have, I think, awareness and other perspectives. Things that could have been edited out. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's just more like interesting. I mean, I was a psych major in college. So like the memory stuff, like I'm like hyper yeah. aware of this stuff too. And it's more of like a curiosity thing of, you know, when I bring awareness to it, I'm like, oh, wait, what am I really doing here? Yeah. Otherwise, I'm just editing and not really thinking about it. But yeah, um, sometimes it's just interesting to think about. Especially, too, because in a way, those moments in France where you had gone through a breakup, which, by the way, is traumatic to your image and story of yourself. Like when we mm -hmm. find someone, we're in a relationship with them, we care about them. Our identities begin to merge with theirs. We start sure. to think of ourselves not just as an I, but as a we. And then the sundering the tearing apart of that relationship forces you to, oh God, like who was I? Mm. <laughs> Similarly to you, I've gone through a lot of really bad breakups where I've been mm. depressed and they would often lead to the biggest changes in my mentality and what yeah. I was doing yeah. in life because yeah. you have yeah. to figure it out. And I'm hearing like for you going through this traumatic breakup, part of it was like parallel making content for the first time and beginning the self-editing process. Mm -hmm. So I imagine to you like the self-editing thing, it's like, really important yeah yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> it yeah. like changed your life in a positive way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think a lot of the negative things have i think youtube's been a space where i'm able to sit with those emotions and then also like share them like one of my friends like recent mm. friends he's like he met me in person for the first time and he'd seen some of my content before we knew each other and he met me he's like oh i thought you were like a like a, a soft boy you know like a sad soft boy he's like yeah. in person like you're a lot more confident oh, yeah, than you're I funny thought. and you're confident and you're assertive and he was like, ah, oh, like it just caught me so off guard because all of your videos, it seemed like you're sad or this or you're down or you're not making friends. And I'm like, I guess it's kind of like a public journal where what I what I am sharing with the world is also like me, you know, processing these things, which tend to, you know, be sad. You know, like, when do you feel called to journal or to talk to someone? It's like, yeah, I'm not doing well, like you're sorting through things. And so that's also out there, you know, publicly, but it also has this mismatch with like who I am. And but I don't feel as compelled to be like, you know, make videos and like, yeah, I'm doing this business thing right now. Like it's going hot. You know, I'm traveling, just met all these cool people, made these connections, like boom, boom, boom. Like that exists, but that I don't feel called. Like that's not a connection thing of like where I derive yeah. a lot of like the content I make. So then there's also this mismatch with like how people see me and how, who I actually am in the world. So that also I'm realizing is like a bit more skewed. I'm like, oh shoot. Like how do I change that narrative too? Because yeah that's not like actual reality then like the reality is is not true like there are these things that happen as well <laughs> well it goes back to your previous point like people see me share everything on youtube that's not true it's portions yeah. and you're telling me now it's often the portion that you have to process it's yeah. like the hard yeah. thing like you made a video about moving out of your 
room for college Mm -hmm. starting to pack and talking about how like every time we move from a place you know it's hard when Mm -hmm. does that begin from i'm here to i'm gone Mm. and maybe we leave parts of ourselves behind and it makes sense that you're thinking these things because you're literally moving and leaving yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and you're processing it but that doesn't mean if i just run into you on this street and i'm like hey man how's it going you're like when we move away from one yeah, place yeah, to another, yeah, yeah, we leave yeah. parts of ourselves behind. Mm, yeah, I, people think, I even got a comment, uh, I posted a video yesterday. It's like, man, like I used to like you for your philosophical thoughts, but now I think you're a bit too philosophical. I'm like, nah, it's, it's not always that deep, but like maybe that's just what I'm sharing. Or like, I don't know really what to say in this, so I make it like philosophical. Or, yeah, because that's how you think. Yeah, and then it's like, the process. even in the, the college moving out video, a lot of people are like, hey man, like it's going to be okay. You know, like it seems like you don't know what to do next or things or like just trust. I'm like, nah, like I have hyper clarity. I know exactly what I'm doing for the next couple of years. The businesses are going great. It's moving in these directions. Like, I'm not worried. Like, I feel more confident than ever. And they're like, it's going to be okay. They're like consoling me, but I'm like, damn, did I come off? Like, I don't know like what's happening. Um, so yeah, it's like this weird mixture. Like, okay, I care about connection and I also care about processing my own feelings. Mm -hmm. YouTube for you kind of in a way does both. Yeah. Meaning that people connect with you as they see you work through your feelings. Yeah. And now you're like, Oh, but that's also not necessarily me. And like, Actually, I feel great about what yeah, I'm going to yeah, do after yeah, college. Yeah, 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 yeah. You said, though, it feels a little weirder to make videos where you're like, oh, yeah, like Creator Camp is killing it. <laughs> like <laughs> Circle Park is crushing it. Just on a new client, like <laughs> bagged up now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, why? Why does that feel weird? Why is that different? It's like an innately human thing to like want to share to put parts of yourself out there when you are struggling. Like, I don't know, like for me, at least when I journal the most, like everything again, going back to I think what I said earlier is just it's when you're working through hard things or, or sad emotions. Um, and so when things are great, you're present. Things are good. You don't really need to do anything. Like, why would I need to go sit down and journal? Like, I, you're living it. And so only moments where I'm slowing down or trying to figure something out, do I feel compelled to share it or to put that part of myself out there in the yeah. world? And um, I talk a lot about energetic echolocation is what I call it with my friends. It's like putting yourself out there with the world and hoping that someone connects with it and it comes back to you. And I think the internet, we can do that at scale. Mm. So I think that's what's so cool about art on the internet is because it can connect and resonate with anyone around right. the world. Um, but I think we do that and artists do that because of like pain that they're feeling, you know, do you also feel this way? You know, mm. I feel like I'm alone in this emotion. Hey, is anyone else out there? You know, and you're putting these signals. And I think a lot of um, of the greatest arts or artists do this Um Oh, I heard a, like this quote way back, but it was like a lot of artists live in their head and they build these inner worlds. And so their whole life is just sharing these inner worlds um, with others in hopes that like, you know, they would be in that world with them as well. So I love that. It's like when you're journaling, you're going through it. You feel alone. Yeah. When I'm sad, I feel alone. And then you're putting energy out, energetic echolocation to find those people Mm -hmm. to feel better. Yeah. And YouTube's become this very reflective process for you. So it feels weird to suddenly be like, yeah, I made six figures. I brought in more than six figures for creator camp. Yeah. This second time I did it. Yeah. It is remarkable though. You mentioned like, well, of course, like I'm going to talk about the vulnerable parts. There are so many people in this YouTube culture today. It's the opposite. They'll talk about the amazing things mm-hmm. that are going on and not the vulnerable ones. And for you, in a way, it's almost the opposite because YouTube started as a way, partially, mm-hmm. to process feelings you were going through a traumatic breakup in a foreign country. Now it's continued to be this reflective journalistic element for you yeah, versus yeah. let me show off what's working really well. Yeah, if anything, I'm like, I need to not like flex more, but like I need to show this other side of myself too because... I think there's things to be learned as well, like from the audience side, because a lot of YouTube was for me in the beginning, but now I'm like, oh, cool. Like maybe me sharing this could also help people in a different way than what I've done before. But how do I lean more into that? Because that feels less natural and Mm. I don't know how to do that. Because like in some ways you're describing, the first step is letting people know you're not alone. I'm sad as well. But the second part you're saying, you're figuring out how to add it more is when you feel sad, here's what you can turn that into and work through it. Like Mm -hmm. for example, oh, hey, I'm in France. I just went through a traumatic breakup, but now I'm starting to make content and I'm learning to process my feelings this way. Mm -hmm. I come back from France. I still feel people aren't really connecting and viewing the world the way I do now with a sense of optimism. Let me start a merch brand, Perspectopia. I'm with friends in Montana. I want more of this. I developed Creator Camp. I imagine Circle Park 
has an emotional element there as well, yeah, but yeah. you're showing them the first half of the story. Mm -hmm. You're not showing them the second half of, and look what I was able to learn and do from yeah, this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Totally, totally. So what was Circle Park story for you? Why start sure. as a creator to start mm. an agency? It's almost like you went over to the dark side. Mm. Exactly, because I didn't have a lot of great relationships with agencies. And so again, of like, you know, I didn't feel like I was treated like a human, is transactional, all these like one night stands, you just numbers, your KPIs to them. Um, so it was like, damn, like this doesn't really feel good. But also like as a creator, like most of creators make the revenue through brand deals, or at least mm -hmm. the ones I'm surrounded by. So it's like a, a core part to the creator industry is advertising. Like you can't really escape that right now. Um, but it feels like there's this disconnect again. And so there's a bit of like frustration frustration with that, but also like you know, opportunity cost of like, I'm like, you guys are doing it wrong. Like these brand briefs are probably hurting you. You're, you could do it better and you'd probably mm -hmm. make more money. And there's a way to actually align the incentives. Um, and then it started because at first creator camp, we had a representative from calm the meditation app come out and they're like, we want to work with these creators. But we don't really know how, like, could you help us? And I was like, yes, yes, I can. Um, and that kind of led to circle park of like, how could we bridge the gap between artists and brands and make advertising like a cool thing where everyone wins and treating both parties well. Mm. So again, it's like a utopian vision of, you know, what if both parties could win? What if both parties could leave satisfied? Like, I think there is a way to do it well. Um, so again, kind of aspirational in that capacity of what it could feel like. Because I had been on some campaigns where like, this is great. This is awesome. How can I create this for others? Because the narrative is often, I got screwed over. I didn't get paid, you know, or this sucks. Like, it doesn't, I don't think it has to suck. I'm hearing this mixture again between the creative. You're like, I think I can figure out a way this is better. The business savvy, you're like, this can be better and there's an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. As well as the emotional, where like, I'm being treated like <laughs> by brands. Yeah. <laughs> All that being said, most people would still be another level of energy to be like, let me go start a third, fourth company. <laughs> And so I'm curious, you said one of the secrets to why you've been able to do this is the friends you do it with. Yeah, yeah. And so like, for example, you know, I work with my co-founder, Will, who you know as well. And mm -hmm. like we do therapy. The relationship has really evolved and changed as we've gone yeah. from friends to working with people. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Creator Camp, you work with a lot of people. Yeah. Chris, Simon, Ryan. Yeah. Others, I'm sure that I'm missing. Right. Similarly, I just met your partner for Circle Park, Asher, one of them. Right. Mm -hmm. I know you think you have two, two yeah. co-founders, yeah. right? So what helps you decide this is someone I want to work with? Because it's like, it's kind of like dating. It's like a pretty big question. Yeah. All these businesses happened by accident. So there it wasn't like, you know, I have this idea, you know, who'd be the, you know, the best person to join me on this team. Um, it's more of like, oh yeah, like we all kind of share this collective frustration. Like we kind of started this project, but now actually we're making money from it. Oh, okay. I guess there's like a business here. Like let's keep going. Because um, it would be odd to be like, no, like you, you're not well suited. Like you have this one. It's like, oh, we came up trait. with this together. We went through yeah. the pain. We came yeah. up with the idea. <laughs> cool. Go away now because I'm going to find a proper co-founder. Yeah. It's yeah. weird. Yeah. So it all started with friendship. Same with Circle Park. It was like, oh, we have this opportunity. Like, oh, Asher and Joey, like I've known them for three years. They've been yeah. great friends. They helped us put together, you know, creator camp and a lot of things we've done there. Like mm. they have great operational capabilities. Of course, I would bring them in because even when I was starting these businesses, I didn't know anyone in the creator world. I didn't have any right. connections. I didn't really use LinkedIn. Like I knew no one. It was just like me making videos in my room. Right. But I wasn't really in the business world yet. So it's just like, these are my friends. This is all I knew. And this is what I have in front of me. Yeah. Like I, it, there wasn't a lot of intention. But now as I start to get into it more and more and learn more and more, I was like, wow. Not that you see the ramifications, but you see how like personalities evolve, how relationships evolve. And it's complex. Like it's... Yeah. It's difficult. It's really difficult. I won't lie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Will and I argue a lot. Yeah. And we have 100% trust in each other. It's like both. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. You mentioned you started off not having this context. Like even when I met you, this is like two and a half years ago at dinner in New York City. Yeah. It's funny because I hadn't been as familiar with your content. So mm -hmm. instead of people coming up to you and be like, oh, you're not a sad boy. That was my first impression of you in real life. So mm. I was like, this guy is energetic. <laughs> like he is doing things. So I had the opposite experience because then I watched your videos. It's like, oh, this is kind of different. Yeah. <laughs> and I say, you know, like I can see, yeah. obviously the thoughtfulness is here, mm -hmm. but it's a different vibe. Sure, sure. Right. And then I've also seen it like you are killing it on LinkedIn. You're one of the very <laughs> few creators I know, genuine creators who also posts 
on LinkedIn. This goes to your point. You've learned to cultivate the business side also as an artist, also focused on yeah. relationships. Yeah. You mentioned that, you know, it's still hard. I'm curious to outside the business partnership side in your personal relationship side, you went through a really bad big breakup in France, yeah. but you've changed a lot as a person since then. Mm -hmm. Have you found it's changed also the type of people that you become interested in on a mm. personal relationship side? Yeah. I went through another breakup since. <laughs> um, yeah, I think business has taught me so much about humans. Going back to what I was saying earlier, it's just mm. you can't escape that. It's just so raw. And I think even with my business partners, I've been lucky because there's such vulnerability and just transparency because we can't really run away from it. Yeah, I think honesty is something I value a lot more now. Um, and I think I have a better radar of just like seeing through things in yeah. people. Um, obviously, I still have like blind spots, but I'm a lot more like... It's, I almost like treat new friends now like business partners or people. Like I view them through a similar radar where I'm like very intense. I'm like, what are their motives? What are they trying right. to what do? Are their who are they? Yeah. So I really like break them down. Maybe it's it's not like in a, not in like a harsh way, but it's more of yeah. just my instinct now where I'm a lot more aware of, of folks. Very thoughtful. Yeah. Um, and then now I'm just like, how can I meet people away from this world? You know, like what if my partner is just yeah. like, you know, a park ranger or something, you know? Something totally different. So you don't necessarily yeah. want to date someone in this world. You're potentially interested in someone who's actually completely outside. Like that sounds sexy to me now. Wow. You know? Cause like this world, there's so much in my head. It's nice. Like in my last relationship, it was beautiful because I could go into a different world. Just not think about yeah. LinkedIn or business or, you know, SOPs. It's moments you of know? your own escape. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is then very much like for me. So there's like balance to be found. But um, I'm intrigued more by people outside of this world now and even new friends. Like yeah. I want friends in different industries. It's just tricky because this industry right. is so sticky. It's so easy <sighs> to relate to Such someone. Such a big part of your life because we yeah. instantly are like, oh, you've been through this. I've been boom, through boom, this boom, too. Boom, 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 boom. Right. And with other people, it's harder to like connect in the same way. Yeah, they but might just be confused. Yeah, and I feel like I'm in such a bubble and such a niche, which is cool. And so I'm like, as a human, I'm trying to like center myself and be able to connect with people in different industries, um, doing different things, radically yeah. different things. But it's less of that like you connect instantly off the dot. All of my creator friends, it's just there's so many points of relatability of like, oh, you you understand brand deals so and the type easy. of emails and the editing and the Premiere Pro thing. And you can hit them with all these niche, you know, little moments that no yeah. one else would understand. So it's like, oh, my God, I get you. You get me. And to feel that for the first couple of times, it's just like, oh, like I feel seen. But now it's like, that doesn't exist with other people because I'm yeah. so far in this. Um, so it's a challenge in a good way for me. I totally get that. I mean, we're here at VidCon. Yeah. We both know <laughs> you and I can just like walk into any random room at VidCon and we're going to find people we yeah. know. Yeah. Like yeah. we don't even really need to plan. It's just like, hey, it's great to catch up. Yeah. Like I walked into the room and I was like, oh, it's Tejas, you know? He's yeah, exactly. Like, oh, hey, Tejas. Or like, <laughs> yeah. Anthro joined us for lunch. Yeah, He's like, yeah, oh, hey. Yeah. I have a very similar experience. So that's why actually more of my friends are creators than founders. Mm, because founders, it's almost too inside baseball. Yeah, and in yeah. some ways, my anxieties get worsened because great, now I'm thinking even more about all the things I'm worried about mm -hmm. versus, mm -hmm. for example, when I speak with you, there are similarities. There are a lot of similarities and there are differences. Mm -hmm. And so there's enough that I feel related and connected and there's enough that's different where I'm not like, oh, yeah, no, I feel that. I feel that yeah. entirely. Because we talked a lot about filming your own videos and stories you make. In some ways, if you ever watch this, it's me editing your story as we go along in conversation, <laughs> yeah, shaping yeah. and guiding. So it's sure. a little bit different than you editing. Yeah, no, it feels like I'm like out of control. Yeah. In, in an odd way, which is like maybe slightly uncomfortable of like, oh, okay, it's going here, it's going there. Yeah, like, because I'm, you're I'm not actually directing the image. Yeah. I'm more guiding us through yeah. the conversation, yeah. which is a different sensation. Yeah, yeah, it's good for me. It's good. Like, I kind of love that. No control. My, my, my last question for you is, I would say, as your story continues to evolve, let's say five, 10 years from now, what do you want your story to be? Wow. The continuation of what I'm doing now, I think of finding that intersection between art and business and creativity um, but doing that in a very vulnerable and human way mm. and showing the transparent you know, side to that of it can be great, it can be bad, but it's all about like humans and you know being a good person at the end of the day. And so I think if I can continue to share that in a, in a raw way, um, then I think that's all I could really ask for you know, of myself. I love that. Max, thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. How are you feeling? That's a wrap. Boom, wrap. Whew.
That's, that was emotionally intense. <laughs> we really, we got into it. Yeah, I love it.